while it might seem like we're winding up in the book of Revelation, we actually still have, have a ways to go to finish what's uh, just three or four chapters. Uh, but these are some of the most significant events. We're getting down to the wire, and, and the Lord's putting the pieces together, the final pieces of the puzzle for us to understand um, all the ramifications, all the directions, all the forces of the enemy that we need to be wary of. We ought to know them by now because Satan's um, instruments, his forces, his strategies, they've never changed once. He still is trying to take over in the realm of uh, political maneuverings. All you have to do is read and see the kinds of things that happen in leadership roles all around the world, and you can see the hand of the devil quite well. We know Satan is maneuvering in military might, and all you have to do is read about death and destruction and warfare and gunfire and bloodshed. And uh, my, my understanding now is that in the Ukraine, about a million people have died both sides combined together and it's like we we don't even comprehend million a million people people somebody knows some mama and daddy loves and cares about some grandma thinks of and remembers some child images their father or mother that is now gone um polit military might is means death and destruction clearly a realm that satan is uh, very accomplished in Religious ecumenism is just um, the, the false means of worship all around the world. Satan's always used that. We, we saw examples in the passage in Acts chapter 7 today where God said, even Stephen quoted, uh, I'm going to give you over to the statues that you are worshiping. And now the Babylonians are coming for judgment. So the devil loves to get people worshiping false gods. Because they're trapped and they're in great danger. And here in chapter 18 of Revelation, does the Bible have much to say about money? Actually, money is just about the most discussed topic in Scripture. Love as a general category would be more, but money, um, especially as a specific choice in behavior, a tool in this world, money is referenced more in Scripture than pretty much anything else. Not because money is in the position um, of some great value pun intended but because money usurps that position money quickly gives us the temptation to chase other gods if we're not going after idols that are look like idols and call themselves religion go after what probably is the strongest religion in our country for sure and that's stuff materialism money possessions and the celebration of all of that so revelation 18 we began looking at last time i want to review but also finish out this chapter today um, about babylon the great that is the name for the um for the machine of materialism the culture is run by the idea of stuff and the pleasure of stuff and the money that is generated by everybody's pursuit of stuff. So in all four of those I mentioned, military might, political maneuverings, um, religious idolatry and materialism, Satan's always been in those realms <clears throat> and they've always been very, very powerful, especially for you and I, we are susceptible in the in the area of idolatry there's something satan knows is a real temptation for you and he brings it time and again and in the area of um, financial um, longings material desires we're all susceptible for that and satan knows that just turn on your tv or look at the website and the ads explode all the time now they know what you really like and they can put their ads for your preferences on the thing that pops up on your phone and we've all done that experiment right where we searched on something or we decided we were going to talk about something and say the word half a dozen times and the next day pew, there it is right on the screen somebody's got one and they can get it to you quick that is the world in which we live so chapter 18 is really emphasizing this is one of the great tools of the devil and this is going to elicit a great judgment from God. I saw another angel 
John says he came down from heaven, great authority. The earth was illuminated by his splendor. It's just a descriptive of the power and the authority of this angel. He's in a unique category, not like every other angel. Verses 2 and 3, with a mighty voice, he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling for demons, a haunt for every impure spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable animal. So he's announcing the fall of this, this city of uh, money and power and prestige. We're not so much talking about just this uh, geographic thing as we are about this monster of materialism that has such effect in so many pe people's lives. In verse 3, you see um, the reference to the merchants. He talks about the nations that are drunk from her maddening wine of adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery, and the merchants of the earth grew rich. This is the first reference to merchants in the book of Romans. I'm sorry, the book of Revelation. It occurs four times in the book of Revelation right here in chapter 18. For I heard another verse from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, and you will not receive her plagues. Of course, that's the obvious call of Christians to separate from that. How many times are we told to separate from the world, to understand we don't love the world, we're not of the world, we don't belong in this world, we're not supposed to be in love with this world. And so here again, you see that same call. James 1.27 is a great verse to to just kind of solidify this point out of so many other places in the New Testament. James says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself pure from being polluted by this world. We're constantly warned of the dangers of this world and how easy it is to be absorbed, to be drawn into Whatever the latest thing. That doesn't mean everything in this world is bad. It just means everything in this world can be taken to excess and become bad. You know, you got to have a car, but you're not supposed to be in love with your car. When you are in love with it, it is you. You don't have it. You got to have a house, but you got to make sure that your focus is on, on balance and responsibility and not on that thing taking control of you. You, you can enjoy uh, the pleasures of this world that are clearly acceptable in Scripture. I like to go to Clemson football games, but I know some people that are pretty crazy about their college football, and you get the idea quickly that they are absorbed in that thing that it controls them. Have you ever seen anybody get themselves all bent out of shape and angry to the point of um, spewing because they're lost? I've seen that plenty of times. I remember the Duke game last year where Clemson lost. How we lost to Duke, I still don't know, but we lost that game, and it was at Duke, and Julie and I went, and we were coming out, and this Clemson fan started running ahead of us, and there were all these Ver Vespa scooters. We're at Duke, you know, so there's a whole line of Vespa scooters that, what do they cost, $20,000 or some unbelievable price. And this Clemson just starts rolling them over. It lays every one of them down. I mean, violently. There's somebody who loves their college football just a little too much. There's everything in the world you can think of that can be abused and that can become a power and a temptation in our lives. So we have to work constantly to keep ourselves from being polluted by the world. Um, I'm excited, you know, Clemson to football. I guess those other teams are playing too, but Clemson football starts in about six or seven weeks now. So, and they're playing many of you guys too. So I'm not so excited actually about that. I, I think I know what's coming. Verse 5, moving along quickly. Her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. The Lord is aware of the power of the forces of all of these things. John Phillips, great commentator, said, There comes a time when the sins of the world, uh, of a nation or a city, reach to heaven and cry aloud for God to act. 
Things have gotten so bad, and it's been going on for so long, and the cry for justice rings out. The sword of vengeance slumbers long. Heaven seems silent and indifferent to earth's corruptions, slanders, and crimes. God himself seems deaf and blind. Then suddenly he acts, and the tale is told. Everybody wonders why God doesn't do something about this until God stands up and does something about it. And there is always coming the point where God is going to fix it. Justice will be served. Everything will be set right. And it's clear this promise comes to us again and again and again. David fixed this thing. I don't know why I'm having problems tonight. So how many times do we see something in Scripture like their cry has gone up to the Lord? Over and over, this is repeated. It happened during the time of the slavery in Egypt. The Israelites cried out to the Lord. And the text in Exodus 3 says, The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. I am concerned about their suffering. Throughout the book of Judges, every incident in the book of Judges is um, a response of God to the cry of the people. They turn their back on God, judgment happens, and then over a period of time, they repent, they cry out to God, and he sends a deliverer. In uh, Psalm 34, we see the simple promise, verse 17, the righteous cry out, the Lord hears them, he delivers them from all their troubles. You're in trouble, what should I do, pastor? Cry out to the Lord. That's the basic formula. Call on him, seek his face. Ask him to intervene. In Acts chapter 8, it is the prayers of the saints and the voice of the martyrs that surround the throne. God gives them a place of special access. And they're constantly saying, how much longer, O Lord? When are you going to do something about this, God? It is the, the voice of the child saying to mom or dad, when, when is this going to happen? Are we there yet? How, how can this keep going? And we're allowed to speak that to the Lord almost in an unsettling way. Because God says, we're going to be about justice someday. And it's okay for you desire, to desire justice. It's okay for you. Lord, I don't understand what's going on in this world. How long are you going to let things go this way? I don't understand why things look so bad. Why there is so much suffering and trauma and difficulty. How much longer, God, until you fix this problem? It is a question of righteousness and justice. When am I going to see it? That's a theme throughout Scripture. And now the sins of this Babylonian system pile up to heaven. God has remembered her crimes. The response is coming. Notice the extreme description of sin in this passage. It's not just her sins are visible to the Lord. What does it say about them? They pile up to heaven. It's a mountain of sins, a growing pile of continuous sin before the Lord. So the believers cry out, what are you waiting for, God? And in fact, the world cries out, where is your God? What, what do you mean God's going to do something about this? He has not done anything in years and decades and centuries. You remember what they said to Peter, where is this coming that you speak of? When is he coming? Everything just keeps going on day by day, sunrise to sunset. And the earth keeps saying that. The people of this Babylonian mindset will keep saying that. God, they're watching the world burn and fall all around them. They never understand their personal culpability. So notice also the vague connection. Maybe it's not so vague. The, vague, the connection with the Tower of Babel. You remember the tower. What did they want? They wanted to make a name for themselves. They wanted to build this giant edifice as high as they could, as visible as they could, as a representative of their power, if you will. They wanted to pile up glory, their name, their authority. And we get to the very end of it. What have they piled up? Their sins. They have built a mountain of sins to the heavens. They have indeed made a name 
for themselves. But it's exactly the opposite of what they uh, had hoped and intended. Just like Satan's pride, his arrogance, his self-yearning backfires and backfires and backfires. Every time you say to Satan, it is a backfire. It is where Satan's strategy is thwarted by you and the spirit living in you once again. And ultimately that end will arrive where those who have been fully in love with his plan and played the pleasures of his plan forever how long, now that all they have is their mountain of accomplishment, a stinking pile of perversity and shame. Look at verse 6. Give back to her as she has given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Pour her a double portion from her own cup. This is the angel's cry for justice. Not the people now. This is the angel saying, I've announced God's judgment. Let them have it, God. They deserve it. Judgment needs to come in this case. And it's nothing more than the historic formula that we know from the beginning. An eye for an eye for a tooth. This is the formula for justice. In the same way you have carried out your crime, that is the way you're going to be repaid for your crime. We follow that same rule today. Uh, now, they violate justice in a lot of places anymore and let people out rather than convict them of their crimes or give them a, you know, a minor sentence for a major crime. But you, you and me, we cry out for justice when we see those kinds of things happening. And the basic, gen the basic definition among all of humanity is equal um, justice for whatever the crime might be. We understand that uh, what you have done deserves a commensurate punishment. Every table of justice has degrees of punishment based on the degree of the crime. Um, listen to Psalm 137. Verse 8, O daughter of Babylon, doomed to destruction, happy is he who repays you for what you have done to us. It's okay to say, I'm waiting for justice, God. I'm waiting for you to set this right, God. I'm looking for when you're going to fix this. You designed the world for justice. Satan has ruined that idea, and I know your word has promised justice is coming. And so Revelation 18 is restating very clearly, very boldly, justice is coming no matter what uh, that you see or hear is happening. Look at verse 7. Give her as much torment and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. So there, there is a kind of an equation for the justice that needs to happen. They have taken advantage of to the fullest extent. They have abused those who d did not deserve to be abused. They have caused harm and loss. They have ruined the lives of as many people as possible and show no shame or sorrow for that. They take what they can. They absorb it and take pleasure out of it. Therefore, they deserve even greater the justice that is to come. In her heart, she boasts, I sit enthroned as queen. I am not a widow. I will never mourn. And then the justice is coming. It is always amazing to, to see inequalities in our world. Now, I'm not talking about equity. That's a different word, and it carries a much different meaning, um, in, and it's one of Satan's great of theologies of the day where because something doesn't look right we have to take from one class or one group and bring them down so that we can elevate another and actually we tell them y'all are wrong and these people uh, they need to be um, blessed or gifted or honored in some way that's more of the idea of equity it's not fair it's not equal Equality, though, is where you can look and see people who have stuff that um, they, they got the wrong way. Can I say that? They earned it the wrong way or abused or they have been in uh, one of these wicked systems or they have, uh, they have um, reaped from corruption. I always really would like to know the story behind the, the guy from Podunk, Georgia, that becomes a congressman and he's worth $50,000 when he becomes 
congressman. And when he's no longer a congressman, six years later, he's worth $50 million. Something's not right about that. But that's what this passage is describing. People who have accelerated their, their Babylonian consumption, if you will, this world being this Babylon, they have accelerated it and they found ways to work the system and they have abused whoever they've had to abuse. They've taken advantage of whoever they've had to take advantage of. Um, let one of us call um, Congressman Podunk and see what he's going to do to help us, right? We elected him. What's he? I don't know, even remember the name of our congressman. Sorry, I'm not picking on him. I don't know his personal situation at all. But there are plenty of them we know um, that I would never vote for and I hope never is going to be my congressman. I saw the story recently of John Paulson, not a congressman. He's a hedge fund manager, big name. He's one of those names uh, that you know in the, the elite circle, uh, worth billions of dollars. A few years ago, John Paulson gave $400 million to Harvard University. Now, I want you to just think about that a minute and see what you know about Harvard and their endowment. Harvard University received from him $400 million. That one lump sum gift is bigger than the endowments of 98% of the colleges and universities in the United States. But he gave it to Harvard, who has by far the largest endowment in the country, billions of dollars that just sit there basically doing nothing but making rich people richer. And I want to look at that and say, are you kidding me? What is it that would cost somebody to give Harvard $400 million? That would be you selling your home, taking all the money, if you even have any equity in your home, selling your car, um, living in a tent off in the woods somewhere, and flooding out your bank account, writing a check to Bill Gates and saying, here, I would like for you to have all the money to my name. Bill Gates, who already has about all the money in the world anyway. I'm just amazed when you look at this world, this system, how quickly and easily the rich get richer and the real people who actually need some help. I'd say there's probably some people in this room who could use some help. You don't get nothing from these people. This is the Babylonian style to things. It is... Um, corruption to the maximum degree. How about take your $400 million and give it where it could actually help people? There's hungry people out there. There's people whose car's broken down and they can't even get it fixed to go back to work. But I'm going to put my $400 million where it is needed the least. That's the way this whole thing works. And you see it all around us all the time where you have this class of people, which is most people, who are, who are working away. You know, I tell Julie, I'm going to the salt mine when I leave the house to come, come over to the office. It's just a little joke. You know, we, we're going back to the labor force day by day by day to work the job, to scrape by a little bit just to pay our bills and, and make it to the weekend. That, that tends to be the mindset. And, and there's another level of people that have everything they possibly could dream of. And no problems, no difficulties. And all they do is cycle that around. Even in the government, they set up the system. Does it not seem rigged to you like it does to me? And the people who have are the ones that get more. And we wind up seeing the victimization. That is what is being described here in Revelation 18. They are building their Babylon. And they're building it up with everything that they've got. Proverbs 29 verse 7 says, The righteous care about justice for the poor. The wicked have no such concern. These are the ones got that face the judgment of God. Proverbs 28, 27, Whoever gives to the poor will lack nothing, but one who turns a blind eye will get many a curse. Be careful before you decide, I'm not giving my money to that person. 
And you know, why don't they just get a job? That's what we used to say all the time about somebody who was going through great difficulty. We decided they didn't need our help. Well, a lot of them actually do need our help. So in chapter 18, if we put verse 6 together, uh, the cry is that God give her as much suffering as she gave others in verse 7 and give her as much difficulty as blessing that she withheld from others. This is a one-two punch. Fledged um, calling out to God that you would bring to pass the full weight of what the world now deserves in verse 8 in one day her plagues will overtake her death mourning and famine she will be consumed by fire for mighty is the lord god who judges her look at verse 9 who when the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxury see the smoke of her burning they will weep and mourn over her why because this was their lives they loved it they love their money. They love their possessions. They love their power. They love their seat in the boardroom and their exclusive clubs and all of the benefits of all of the system that has been feeding into their lives and that they have been committing this adultery with. Worshiping it is what that means. This is their idol. This is the system that Satan has established to bring all those people into the fold. And now it is burning down in front of them. And their lives are broken. They are in great sorrow. Verse 10. Terrified at her torment, they will stand off and cry, Woe, woe to you, great city, you mighty city of Babylon. In one hour your doom has come. Now, we mentioned last time, it talks about destruction in a day and doom in an hour. And I really think that's a reference to the bowls of wrath coming in rapid succession, coming one right upon uh, the next in such um, immediate turmoil, turmoil, overflowing judgment upon this city and spreading out upon the whole world. You can imagine the extreme um, shock at this kind of destruction we know what destruction looks like we've seen um, acts of God they call it storms and events that have torn a path through a town or have flooded for miles on a coast somewhere but this is going to be more like the destruction you see in a disaster movie I, I'm, I'm too practical I'm too engineering minded when I see a disaster movie uh, I sit there and think there is no way in the world that plane could actually fly through those two buildings falling over at the same time and mountains of debris falling through the air going to hit that plane it's going to crash so I get a little too practical when I see those movies but you know the movies I'm talking about they are in the middle of one disaster and before they're out of that disaster the next disaster is already falling in on them so the plane's taking off while the earthquake's opening up all around them. And already you see the next thing coming straight at them. And it's like, why am I watching this stupid movie? But I'm going to tell you, when we read in Scripture about what this destruction is going to look like, seven bowls of wrath, one right on the heels of the next. And it's going to be something that no ridiculous movie could ever even portray. The full expression of the judgment of God that everything righteous in the world has been crying out for since this world has existed. There are martyrs on the throne that have been there since the Egyptian captivity. 4,000 or so years. Crying out to God. How much longer, God? When is this going to happen? How much longer? The ranks of the martyrs will explode in these last years. And there will be many, many far more people that will fill up the, the bleacher seats around the throne, crying out to God, what are we waiting on? So I want you to notice um, in, in the prior passages before Romans 18, the emphasis has on repentance a call that emphasis is gone there's no more of that no more call to repentance at all now it's all about justice 
and justice is coming. They have refused to repent. God has given them opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. Uh, maybe you could go back in your own spiritual timeline and think about how God worked in your life to get you saved. How many times he brought a witness? How many times he, he had to knock you upside the head? How many times he had to take you by the lapel and say, salvation is for you? Would, would you receive the gift of salvation? How many times he had to convict the sin in your life for, for you to finally say, yes, Lord, I believe you, I trust you, I need you, I love you. Well, in the book of Revelation, remember, we see that again and again. Yet they still refused to repent. God sent the messengers. God skywrote. I know that's probably not a word, but you get the idea. People say today, if he would just write it in the sky, I would believe in him. No, you would not. You would not. That would last about as long as the cloud writing, and it blows away, and it's gone. I'm sorry, I'm going to get this mic fixed, I promise you. We're, we'll finish it tonight, and Something's got to happen. David will make it happen, I know. Um, verse 11. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Second reference to the merchants. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones, and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, and scarlet cloth, every sort of citron wood, and articles of every kind made of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble, cargoes of cinnamon and spice, of incense, myrrh, and frankincense, of wine and olive oil, and fine flour, and wheat and cattle and sheep, horses and carriages, and even human beings sold as slaves. This is a list of 28 items. That makes up basically the shopping list. Okay, these are the luxuries of the world in the time that this was written, the first century, probably about 90 AD. This is what the merchants sold and sold. This is what the rich people loved and absorbed. You could make your list today, right? You could find the, the eight or ten largest, um, most uh, successful stocks in the market these days go to whatever their product is and you'll be able to say uh, this is what the world is all about today you can see the things that people put the most money into entertainment have you looked to see what a taylor swift ticket costs i hope not i don't think you ought to be going to taylor swift concerts personally um, that's a lot of money if nothing else do you have four thousand dollars laying around to go listen to that sorry music Sorry, I hope there, there are no little girls in here, so no Taylor Swift uh, fans. Maybe, maybe Zoe's a Taylor Swift. Good for you. Good for you, Daniel. Testify, sister. Amen to that. Now, read the lyrics of some of those songs. You could talk about uh, AI and NVIDIA um, computer chips. You can talk about um, the, the most expensive coffees that you find now. Isn't it amazing how many different labels they can stick on a bag of coffee with a $20 price tag? You can talk about all kinds of different um, avenues for pleasure and enjoyment and personal excitement and whatever it is and make the list and it says they are no more. No one buys their cargoes anymore. And they will say the fruit you long for is gone from you. All your luxuries and splendor, they have vanished, never to be discovered again. The merchants, third reference, who sold these things and gained their wealth from her will stand off terrified at her torment. They will weep and mourn and cry out. That's the second layer of the riches and the, the richness of this world. The first layer, the list of all these commodities, the things that rich people toss back and forth with one another. But now we're talking about the people who drive it up in the truck who mark it off on the list, who package it and send it. We're talking about the bean counters and the chart watchers, the ones who got rich off the distribution chains of the commerce. No longer are they getting rich either. It is gone for everybody. It has been completely destroyed. It ought to be even easier now for you to understand why Jesus says no man can serve both God and money. You cannot have two masters. You can only have one master. And if you're uh, longing for and pursuing the riches in this world, then you're at great risk for that to become your God. And if it becomes your God, 
have forsaken the God of Scripture. Then we see again, verse 16, they cry out, Woe, woe to you, great city. Same cry as in verse 10. You're dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. In one hour, everything is brought to ruin. Every sea captain and all who travel by the ships, the sailors and all who earn their living from the sea will stand off. When they see the smoke of her burning, they will exclaim, Was there ever a city like this great city? They will throw dust on their heads and with weeping and mourning cry out again, Woe, woe to you, great city, where all who had ships on the sea became rich through her wealth. There was nothing like this. That says to me Satan thought he was going to win this time. He's building the tower. He's trying to establish the, the dominance of the created over that of the, of the creator. He's trying to be able to build his realm. It is the most glorious thing the world has ever seen. And now it's gone. Justice has come. And it's clearly um, the, the full extent of Satan's effort has been ravaged by the simple justice of God. Verse 20, rejoice over her, you heavens. Rejoice, you people of God. This is not a chapter that's supposed to make you say, shake your head and be sorrowful because the stuff's going to get wiped out. If you're walking with Jesus, you're supposed to rejoice over this. The idolatry of this world, the adulteries, spiritual adulteries of this world to pursue the vessels of this world, that's coming to an end. All those who have reviled our God, who have hated our God, who have shucked their uh, fist at our God and drawn themselves to the falsehood of this world, all of that is coming to an end. God has judged her with the judgment she imposed on you. Believers waged war against the saints, Revelation 13. The false church became drunk on the blood of the saints, Revelation 17. And now God says, okay, now it's become enough. Now it's over and we will finish it. Look at verse 21 through 24. This is the end of the end. And the great battle comes in the next chapter. A mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a large millstone, threw it into the sea and said, with such violence, the great city of Babylon will be thrown down, never to be found again. Uh, the music of harpists and musicians, pipers and trumpeters will never be heard in you again. Imagine the revelry, the celebration, the joy, the bars, the alcohol, the dancing, all the happiness they thought they had. No worker of any trade will ever be found in you again. The sound of a millstone will never be heard in you again. No factories, no body to repair because there's nothing to repair. Your house didn't just crack or your plumbing stopped working or your lights don't come on. That's the next phrase. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. It is totally obliterated. The voice of bridegroom and bride will never be heard in you again. One of the most joyous events in the world described. The merchants were the world's important people. Isn't that interesting, that phrase in the middle of this verse? They think they're the important people. This, this is the merchant class that's getting rich off the rich people. I'm not talking about just people who work jobs. You know what kind of specialty class is being described here. The, the factory owners and uh, the people who are moving all the product and working the deals. By your magic spell, all the nations were led astray. That sounds like advertising to me. That's Madison right there and the merchants they ply their trade they work their tricks they sucker you in and you need it I want it it's better than what I've got now I deserve it that's the magic spell verse 24 in her was found the blood of prophets and of God's holy people of all who have been slaughtered on the earth and God said enough the time has come enough let me just share with you from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I think this is a worthy reminder of where we are supposed to be 
and how focused we've got to be. Verse 11, no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Revelation is about the false foundations that Satan is trying to establish. If anyone builds on this foundation, Jesus, using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is. The day, that's where we are now in Revelation. The day of judgment and wrath will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire. And the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder, you and me, will receive a reward. If it is burned up, that's Revelation 18. The builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved. If he's already saved, his name is in the book. Even if he's um, made these wrong choices, if he's seeking Jesus, he will suffer loss and be saved, even though he will be as one escaping through the flames. When we get to heaven, when we get to the new kingdom especially, there will be people there that have a sunburn. There will be people there that have a smell to them. I think, yes, the Lord's going to recreate. He's going to fix all of that. But I think there's also going to be the moment where we face the, the throne of the Lord and we face the judgment of our works. That's what this is talking about. And you're going to see people weeping in that instance. You're going to see people sorrowful because they love Jesus, but they built their life on the world's commodities. And they never called on to the harm that it was doing to them. And that stuff is burned up, and it's like they escape into heaven, singed and smoking. And everybody's going to know. That's why this is so important to understand what the great Babylon is. And the risk, it is a great danger for all Christians. That's why it's so many places in Scripture, page after page after page. Do not be overcome. Do not love this world. Do not embrace the principles of this world. Do not seek the gain of this world. Godliness with contentment is great gain. First Timothy 6, we looked at that last Sunday night. Scripture after Scripture after Scripture saying, Hold on, people of God. Slow down. Wake up. Know what's important and know what's not important. And looking at how all that stuff ends, that, that's a wake-up call to make you think whether you want to live for that stuff or not. Let's pray. Father, we, we love you. We praise your name. We lift you up. We thank you that your word is so clearly true to give us warning. To tell us to be careful, to, to slow down, to don't go in that direction and don't live for those things. I thank you, Lord, that you are um, sincere and secure in your promise that if we're truly saved, we are eternally saved. But I thank you as well that you're always trying to keep us faithful and keep us strong in loving you so that you can accomplish great things in our lives and we can enter into your presence joyously with great celebration so give us the wake-up call make us aware show us what it what it is where we're at risk god and don't let it take over help us to repent and overcome i pray in jesus name amen amen i want you to just process this i hope it won't just be a 30 second thing but you can process and think about in the days ahead lord Where's the risk for me? What is the thing that I love more than anything else? That's the thing that is probably the greatest danger for you. And so you've got to be able to work through that and resolve that that's, that's not going to be my God. And I'm not going to worship it or love it. Ask him what that is. Seek him during this time. We'll take just a minute or two. And you let the Lord speak in your heart. If you need to come publicly, come now.
Thank you. Bobby Phillips, would you close us in prayer, please?